You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. John Prine was born and raised in Maywood, Illinois. As a teenager, he took guitar lessons from the Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago and began writing his own songs. After he was drafted into the Army, he was sent to Germany for two years. Upon returning home, he got a job as a mailman and started performing around Chicago. Unexpectedly, he got a record deal with Atlantic after Jerry Wexler saw him perform one night. In 1971, Prine went to American Sound Studios in Memphis to record his first album, which was released later that year. In this episode, for the 50th anniversary, Margot Price, Amanda Shires, Aaron Osman, Dave Prine, Bobby Wood, and Gene Chrisman join us for a detailed look at how the record came together. This is The Making of John Prine. John's first album just kind of showed that he had a gift. It's not like some people were like their early work is embarrassing or something, or like it's something that he had to work for. I think John was just like, he was touched. That first album, I think in terms of the, the total quality of what was on that album, some people can't do that in a lifetime. You know, in his first album, it's like, wow. There's no throwaways in that thing. There's a timelessness about this album. Um, It has so many songs that are now considered standards. John Prine self-titled, Every Lesson You Need in Songwriting and Every Lesson You've Learned and Have Yet to Learn in Life, all in one spot. Well, I've been writing since I was like 14, but I never thought about doing it for a living, you know? I mean, as, as far as I got with that was standing in front of the mirror trying to curl my lip and look in the mirror and how I should hold a guitar, you know. I was playing around and writing for about six, seven years, and one night I found myself down at a place called the Fifth Peg on Armitage Avenue in Chicago. It was across the street from the Old Town School of Folk Music. And uh, I was watching an amateur thing, and uh, people was getting up and, like, and they was, they was pretty bad, you know. And uh, I had a couple of beers too many, so I said so, like loudly. And uh, some guy at another table says, well, why don't you get up? So I said, oh, well, of course. <laughs> I got up and sang uh, Muhlenberg County and uh, Hello in there and uh, Sam Stone. And they asked me if I wanted a job as a singer. So I had to run home and write six more songs to fill up 40 minutes of time. I wrote another six songs and ended up on my first record in about two weeks. I'm Erin Osman. I'm a music journalist and author, and I wrote a book about John Prine's first album. It's for Bloomsbury's 33 and a Third series, and it comes out this November. Well, the amazing thing about this record is that it is the result of a series of happy accidents. Um, really, like just the most brilliant coincidences happened. Prine, in the beginning at least, he was a pretty reluctant performer right? Like he wrote songs as a hobby to kind of entertain himself. And when he was discovered, his discovery story is kind of two prongs. The first was locally in Chicago. Um, He wandered up to an open mic night at this club called The Fifth Peg. Some folks who worked at the Old Town School of Folk Music, they opened up this club. And so of course, the students of the Old Town School of Folk Music um, would wander over there for open mics and to hang out. And Prine was a student. He was a guitar student there. And um, so, of course, one night he came into the club and, and thought, you know, I'll give this a shot. It just so happened that he sunk the room. Like everyone was like jaw dropped. What just happened? You know, um, he tells a story that, you know, the room went silent. And it was one of those silences that I'm sure were like seconds felt like centuries. You know, <laughs> like it was kind of one of those dramatic moments. Um, but everyone who was in that room, including Prine's guitar teacher at the time, um, was like, wow. I had no idea 
that that was going to come out of this guy, this like unassuming guy from the suburbs, right? But like, this is really important. I'm Dave Prime. I'm the oldest of the Prime brothers. I said, look, John, all you need is three chords. If you got three chords and a capo, you can play anything on the guitar. And so I showed him and he picked it up like, like that. And, and that was the start of it all. I took guitar lessons at the Old Town School of Folk Music here in Chicago. And uh, so later I talked him into going down there and getting learning finger picking techniques and stuff like that. And uh, that was just kind of the start of it. At that point, I had never, never heard any songs that he wrote. I don't know how soon he started writing, but I'll never forget. I don't think he was 20 yet. I think he was just still a teenager. And uh, we were playing old time music one day over at my folks' house. And he said, hey, you know, I've been writing some songs. Would you like to hear them? And I thought, oh, geez, you know, because Chicago at that point, singer songwriters are popping up like dandelions on your lawn. And about one out of 100 was really good. And the rest were pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> And so I, okay, John, do your thing. And I don't remember which ones he did now because it's been so long ago, but it totally blew me away. I thought, my God, this is, this is my brother who I taught three chords to, and now he's doing this. And it was, it was incredible just to hear it. It was like, this is a whole new John. I didn't know this guy was in there. <laughs> it's totally amazing. My brother taught me a couple of chords on the guitar, mm -hmm. and I started writing right away. I wrote a song one night, and uh, took me my first song took me about three hours. <laughs> and I went downstairs and I told my mother that I wrote a song, and so she sat down to listen to it. And I got about halfway through it, and I was picking it. And she started singing, uh, "Will the circle be unbroken?" <laughs> and I got so embarrassed that I, I, I don't know—I don't even know a word to that song today. I just threw the lyrics away, and I didn't write anything for a little while after that. You know, I didn't know—I thought I had my own tune. So when he sort of started introducing his songs to his brothers, like at the family home, I think they were really surprised. Like, oh, this is coming out of our baby brother, who was like a juvenile delinquent hanging out at the pool hall. You know, like it was pretty amazing to them. Prine was pretty quiet, introspective. Um, there was a lot of deliberation with him in social settings. He wasn't particularly outgoing or performative. No one had imagined that John was coming up with any of this stuff, let alone had any sort of desire to perform at all. When all these happy coincidences started happening, they were so proud of, of their brother. I mean, they come from a lower middle class family, you know, in the Western suburbs, a very modest upbringing so to have someone from the ranks become like a star is so unlikely um and so powerful and i think i think that's the appeal of brian right he kind of makes us believe that like we can do this too that anyone can have it um even though his talent was completely singular after i learned my first couple of songs i found it easier to make up songs than uh to try and learn my favorite ones. They would never sound anywhere near as good as the records sounded. So I would just make something up and I'd sing it till I got tired of it. It was more or less a hobby I kept uh, to myself. The group I hung around with, the fellows, uh, I knew, they didn't know I could play the guitar or uh, make up songs. So I did it off and on for a while and then I uh, kind of dropped it and uh, went in the army got drafted when I was uh, right out of high school, uh, 17. He was 1A in the draft. And uh, I said, John, go join the Navy. He said, those guys don't have a Navy, so you'll be safe. And nobody's gonna be, nobody's gonna be shooting at you. And then he didn't, want to, he didn't want to spend four years. And so he went ahead and got drafted in the army. And they sent him for basic down to Fort Polk in Louisiana which was where the basic training for Vietnam was done. So he went through there with a group, and I forget how big it was, but he and one other guy got sent to Germany, and the rest of them went to Vietnam. And I thought, John, somebody up there is watching over you carefully. 
it's, you know, while they were all dealing with that hell over there, he was uh, drinking German beer and working in the motor pool. So. <laughs> Now, I took my guitar with me over there, and I started, uh, I found a renewed interest in it. The fellows uh, would wake me up at night when they'd come in from drinking and uh, ask me to play a few country songs on the guitar. And it became, it made a lot of friends for me in the Army. And I started to write a few songs again. And as soon as I got out of the Army, I went back to the post office because that was the, most, the safest job I had at the time. And... Uh, it was good benefits working for the government. So uh, I was a mailman for six years, and um, I was—I I will always say that once you got a regular route and you know what street you're on, you've got a lot of time on your hands. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> being in a library with no books. <laughs> so. Uh, I would make up songs to amuse myself on a mail route, and some of them would stick with me. And that's the way I wrote my, uh, what became my first song, so I ended up singing publicly. And then one night, Roger Ebert, who is the film critic for the Chicago Sun-Times, he wandered into the fifth peg um, during one of Prine's performances. At this point, he'd become sort of a regular performer at the club, and he had the same reaction, jaw-dropped, wow, this is incredible. These guys' words are so poetic, they're so piercing, they're so evocative. And so instead of writing his Friday film review, um, he dedicated that space to covering Prime. He was supposed to review a film and he thought, nah, that film's terrible. I'm going to review this singing mailman instead. You know, to tell Chicagoans, hey, you have a new son. There's a new son of the city and his name is John Prime. Roger was a very popular columnist and everyone would turn to the, you know, the page in the paper to read his film review. And so when they saw that he wrote a music review instead, um, Chicago took notice. Because it's very much a town that's kind of look after your own. Um, Chicago is very of itself. It sort of loves all of the things that it makes and it celebrates its sons and daughters that are sort of its creative figureheads. So when Roger Ebert paid attention to Prime, everyone else in Chicago started to. Prime started booking gigs at bigger clubs. Um, he ended up at a club in Old Town called the Earl of Old Town, which was like one of the most popular folk clubs in Chicago. And that's where Prime was discovered by Chris Christofferson. You were sitting at the Earl one night and uh, Chris Christofferson walked in and what happened there? Oh yeah, Stevie yeah. Goodman brought him over. And uh, Steve sings over at the Earl a lot too, along with uh, Bonnie Kolak and uh, the Holstein brother. And uh, uh, Stevie had been playing with uh, Christofferson over at uh, uh, Richard Harding's place, Quiet Night, and uh, he brought him over to hear uh, some of my songs over to Earl, and uh, he was about the only audience. It was pretty late at night, you know, there's a lot of empty chairs around. Uh, we were getting ready to close up, but uh, we stayed open an extra hour, you know. Did he say, I'll make you a star, kid? No, no, he just, uh, no, he just, uh, uh, he listened to the songs. That was good, good enough for me. Steve Goodman and Prine became friends when Prine became a regular performer at the Earl of Old Town. Um, Steve was a performer there as well. Steve had a gig opening up for Christofferson. Christofferson was doing a residency at this Northside club called The Quiet Night. And Christofferson loved what Steve was doing. And Steve played, I believe it was Sam Stone. One night and Christofferson was like, how did you write that song? That's brilliant. Like, tell me about the song. He's like, well, you got to, you know, you got to hear my buddy who wrote it. You know, I'm, I'm covering my buddy. So, yeah, through a series of, of maneuvers, Steve coaxed Chris Christofferson and weirdly Paul Anka, who was also in town, the, the Canadian pop star, to come see Prine at this club. And same reaction, jaw dropped. This guy's incredible. Um, how is this guy who's a mailman in the suburbs writing these songs? You know, it was, it was vexing, um, but it was exciting. Just based purely upon Steve Goodman's enthusiasm and goodwill, um, that he went to this club to see a mailman sing at like two in the morning, you know, after hours. Um, it's pretty incredible, but I think that speaks to like Steve Goodman's um, dedication to his friendships, you know, in the Chicago scene and particularly his love of Prime. I met Steve. Uh, after I started playing at this place, the Fifth Peg, Steve come over to, to check me. Everybody's come over to check me out. Over well, yeah, it's just a minute. small area up there in Old Town where all yeah. the clubs were. 
But and uh, a lot of them hung out at er the Earl of Old Town, uh, and uh, Goodman, like would play over there all the time. And uh, I'd heard his song on the radio, City of New Orleans, because they had a he didn't have a record out, but they'd play this one station. He used to play tapes of new songs, and I figured I knew what Steve Goodman looked like, you know, from listening to his voice. You know how you kind of get a picture right. of him. I thought he was this tall, skinny guy with like a college haircut. You know, kind of a long, drawn-out face with maybe a little goatee or something. <laughs> and this little guy comes in, you know, and he's big, fat cheeks and everything, and comes up to me and shakes my hand, introduces himself as Steve Goodman. So I think from that minute on, man, we were just buddies. Like, you know, we did it all together. We went to, we conquered the musical world in New York and got record contracts within the first 24 hours we hit New York. It was all like a lot of Turner's kind of story, you know. Paul Anka, who was with Christofferson at the club the night that they discovered Prine, he offered Steve Goodman and John Prine two plane tickets to New York so they could go and record some demos. Because Paul Anka was like, well, you know, maybe I can help these guys out. Maybe I can get them a record deal. Maybe I, be I can become their manager, which he did. You know, he did become their manager early on. Um, so, yeah, they, they flew out to New York on Paul Anka's dime. And yeah, they got off the plane and they picked up a copy of the Village Voice in the airport um, and they saw that Christofferson was performing and they were like, well, <laughs> this is an, you know, another in a series of amazing coincidences. Um, so yeah, they went down to Greenwich Village, their cab pulled up in front of the bitter end. And as they're getting out, they look up and Christofferson's walking across the street and they're like, what? So of course, Steve is very outgoing and, you know, he was like, Chris, Chris, and Chris ran over and then Christofferson goes, hey, where's your buddy? Where's, where's the mailman? And Goodman's like, uh, he's standing right here. You know, like that's how, that's how quiet and unassuming Prine was, you know, compared to Goodman. But yeah, so Chris invited Goodman and Prine um, to perform with him that night. As it happened, um, it was sort of an industry showcase that night and Jerry Wexler was in the audience and he wanted to sign Prime. And so, so that's what happened. Prime got a record deal with Atlantic. When he got the contract with uh, Atlantic, and he was just sort of in low earth orbit at that point, <laughs> I said, my God, you know, my little brother's going to go make a record. There's a song here about uh, smiling illegally. It's a sing along song, so you can sing along at home. <laughs> When I woke up this morning, things were looking bad. Seemed like total silence was the only friend I had. A bowl of oatmeal tried to stare me down, and one knew it was 12 o'clock before I realized I was having no fun. When he got the contract with Atlantic Records, they paired him with the legendary producer, R.F. Mardron. And what I surmised is he ended up in Memphis because um, they had recently made Dusty in Memphis there at American with that band. And I think it just made sense for them to kind of work in that setting again. R.F. Martin was, was big time. He was all over Atlantic's artists and Aretha. My God, you know. And, and so... Here's John Prime from Maywood and his guitar, and <laughs> you've got a reef, Martin. Well, it's a huge jump. I mean, it happened so quick. He was a solo act, and he'd sit down and he'd play his guitar and sing his songs, and that was rock solid. And now all of a sudden, he was in his studio with a bunch of musicians and this full everything. But the really fascinating thing about this session is that R.F. Mardron had never made a folk record before. The Memphis Boys, the band, they had never played on a folk record before. And really, you know, Bobby Wood and, and some of the other Memphis Boys, um, they weren't particularly fans of folk music. This is Bobby Wood, and I played on the, the John Prine album in the Memphis at American Studio. And, uh, you know, we were, we were used to doing uh, really hard uh, R&B and uh, pop and some country, but not much, and, and uh, mostly rock and roll. And when they came into the American studio, it was like, what? 
uh, he he was um, just kind of out, way out of the bag for our uh, type of music. You know, I I just didn't know where to place him. And uh, yeah, it, it definitely wasn't our bag. If you if you want to put us in the bag, of course we were in about four different bags, but that wasn't one of them. <laughs> but you know, we still did our did our best to do a good job always, as always. But uh, nothing against him. You know, we just like. Uh, is this folk music or what is this? <laughs> you know? My name is Gene Chrisman. I played on the first John Prine album, played drums on it. John's, it was kind of folky. Like Bobby told me, he said, man, I, you really don't know what to play on uh, folky type stuff, you know, because we wasn't really into folk type music. And I guess the words were okay. I'm not, I'm not knocking the words. I just couldn't understand the, the folk music. I think that was my main problem. You know, I, I thought his songs was great. You know, I, I just didn't quite get the folk type thing that, that he he fell into, you know. He, he definitely, his, his audience is totally different than any of our audience, you know. So, me being basically a melody person, I love I love melodies. And uh, it uh, was kind of Light on that, but it, you know, it, most most folks folk songs have got three chords. You know, that's not not mean to sound anything bad. It's just like uh, that's the way folk folk music goes. You know, and most of our stuff was like Wilson Pickett, hard hitting R and B type stuff. They thought it was too spare, um, and they didn't know what to do with it musically because folk music is so much about the lyrics. So this session, it could have been a disaster, right? It could have gone really poorly because it's it's a producer and a band that didn't really know where to put Prine. Like he wasn't quite country, he wasn't quite folk. The music was so spare, right? Because like he wasn't a sophisticated player. He used a couple of chords and that's about it. So yeah, I think it just sort of speaks to the Memphis boys professionalism, right? Um, and they, you know, they have a mission, which is to make hits for labels. And if they don't deliver on that, then they failed. And so I think they felt like a deep sense of responsibility to do something effective with this record, even if it was sort of out of their wheelhouse. And I think a lot of stuff I did play, the you know, for piano. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, it's just, you start, we as a production team started, would start listening to, as to where to get on this project, and I really didn't hear a lot of heavy piano, you know, for sure. And I kind of kept it into the lighter bag, you know, to, to match him. We we always tried to match the artist's voice with what we played and not be too heavy or too light or whatever, you know. So uh, I remember playing, uh, you know, Wurlitzer on a lot of stuff that we did. And sometimes I saw some things I, I think I laid out on. I didn't, I didn't even play because by that time... If I didn't hear something amazing on the keyboards, uh, you know, I just laid out. You know, a lot of the first part of John of uh, Sam Stone, it was just mostly, I think, guitar. Well, I couldn't really hear what I played on it. If I played anything, it may have been brushes or something, you know, because I didn't hear it heavy. You got drummers who can play just about anything, and some of them just overplay on stuff that don't need to be there. That's the way I feel about it, you know. Some stuff can just get over, overbearing. There's so many fills and all this stuff and beating and banging on a ballad, you know, and that's not that's not necessary to me. We all work together as a as a production group. You know, Elvis, even when Elvis came in, he realized right quick that uh, there was five or six people there that was, uh, you know, it's, it's like two heads are better than one. And it's kind of the way we all worked, you know. We'd get in the studio and try different things. Some some stuff worked and some didn't. Uh, so it's just it's kind of what we did. And back kind of in those days for me, it was uh, learning what not to do, you know. And I think the rest of the guys were like that. We were, we were kind of like the uh, Motown guys in, in one sense. Of course, most of their stuff was R&B. But if there were any two of us on a... On the record, I mean, it was going to lean towards Memphis, you know, because that's just what we did. The great thing about five or six great people in the studio, minds, you know, somebody's going to be the quarterback for that day, you know. So you just fall in and try try to enhance what they're doing. And if you, if you can't, you lay out, you know. If I had to play a, like a slow song or something, I may lay out on a verse or something and 
or, or an intro or something unless somebody else. It's just like when we cut always on my mind on Willie. Well, Bobby Wood played the intro to that, and then we came in later. You know, it's just one of those kind of songs, and that's just the way we work them out. Yeah, we listen to it and say, well, why don't we try this or try a different feel on it or do something to it, you know. We just never knew until we started working on it to figure out what to play, who was going to do what. We just kind of played off of each other because we all stuck together. We was in that studio, the same bunch of players for about five years. Same guys cut on everything. So the Memphis Boys um, were the house band at American Sound Studio in Memphis. American Sound Studio was one of the smallest and mightiest like independent recording studios in the region. Um, if we think about bands like The Wrecking Crew in Los Angeles, um, the Memphis Boys were sort of the counterpart to The Wrecking Crew. They were the Memphis version of The Wrecking Crew. And they were known for really settling into this sort of just spectacular groove, right? All these guys played by feel, right? It was all um, done in intuition. Um, they are on so many iconic recordings, um, so many hits. And yeah, they are just a, a monolith in the history of popular recorded music. We have a lot of people to come in and cut, like Neil Diamond, Elvis, and Dusty Springfield, Arthur Conley in the box top, Tula Clark, and uh, Dion Warwick, you know, B.J. Thomas. I've heard that we in in the five years we cut, we had 122 chart records. And then Prine was brand new to recording. You know, he'd done a couple local appearances um, in Chicago, but he'd never been in a major studio. The setting was completely foreign, and I think that he was a little intimidated, right? He tells stories about how, like, you know, you can't tell musicians who play 10 times better than you that they're doing something wrong. I think he felt a little bit like a fish out of water, and I think that they worked really hard. Well, I heard he was scared when he first came there. You know, wasn't really sure what we thought. I don't know if we, what we thought about him or anything, but we always got along with people, you know. As I remember, he just went along with what we felt, you know, and, and put it on tape, and it sounded pretty good, you know, just the way it was every day. You know, I, I knew that he was... Uh, Seems to be real timid, you know, but uh, I, I didn't I didn't know that he was in awe of us because <laughs> we would just come to the studio every day to, to do our work and then go home, you know. It was, we worked around the clock just about. I mean, we showed up at the studio at noon, went and ate, and, uh, and then came back around 1.30 or 2 o'clock and started working and would not go home until wee hours of the morning, you know, 2 or 3, 4 o'clock. So that was just what we did. Prine's first wife and Carol talks about um, how he would come back to their hotel room kind of really tired at the end of the day because they did things over and over and over, you know, trying to find the right feel and the right sound. It's really interesting. It's it's kind of three three factions that were completely inexperienced, right? Like in this setting, working together and making something that I think turned out pretty pretty brilliantly. Ah, but fortunately, I have the key to escape reality and you may see me tonight with an illegal smile it don't cost very much but it lasts a long while won't you please tell the man i didn't kill anyone no i'm just trying to have me some fun Hey y'all, I'm Margo Price. I'm here to talk about John Prine's first album. It talked about so many social and political themes in that first album, but he did it with like such grace. It didn't seem contrived or like he had an agenda. It was just very like observational in what was going on in the world and in our country and in the human experience in general. And then you've got like, illegal smile which is like so covertly like a weed song <laughs> i asked him about that song a lot and he never would give me a straight answer but the the like twinkle in his eye told me like that i was obviously on to something <laughs> hello i'm amanda shires john prine's favorite we're talking about john prine's john prine self-titled record 
John Prine. At the Station Inn a few years ago, he did the whole the whole record from start to finish, like in order during the Americana Awards. And I, I played my set before and then I joined him. At that point, I had never heard him sing every song off the record. I've heard, I heard, you know, like his favorite ones to play at the moment, you know, because he kind of quit playing Illegal Smile when um, we became more legal. <laughs> he always claimed that it wasn't about dope. <laughs> and, and I always thought that he was joshing you because I mean, there's, uh, when he talks about it in the song, it's um, at one point, it doesn't cost very much, but it lasts a long while. Now, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay, you could say that was a smile, but it, to me, it sounds like a smile that was aided by something. <laughs> so I don't know. Everybody always thought that was about marijuana, including myself. <laughs> There's no way to prove right? That it's about smoking weed um, because Prine never disclosed that publicly. But I mean, Prine was hanging out in Old Town, right? Which is where all of Chicago Bohemia hung out. It's where all the hippies and all the head shops were. And so, you know, he had to have been very aware of the double entendre, right? Like the double meaning of this song. But that's the brilliance of Prine, right? Like he was very sly about a lot of things. And I think that this song is a great example of that. Um, it's hilarious. Like we all pick up on the double meaning, right? Of an illegal smile. Um, but you know, in interviews, Prine would insist it's because he had an illegal smile because everything sort of struck him as funny or absurd, like in really inappropriate settings, right? So like he would be the guy chuckling in the corner for like reasons that people couldn't understand. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that's a fine, that's a fine telling. Um, but yeah, the double meaning of the song is undeniable. And, you know, Prine was very much in that scene. And so it, it makes perfect sense to me that it would have both meanings. And when I first started writing, I used to really, um, really get into another world, like, just uh, walking down the street, delivering the mail, or sometimes driving a car, you know. <laughs> I should be paying attention to the road, but yeah. I don't know, I get very uh, far away. I, I try and explain it to some friends that once um, I had one of these spells when I was a, about 13, I told my parents about it and they sent me to an eye doctor. <laughs> 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 but I just told them, I, sometimes I felt very um, far away yet uh, felt like I could see things as if I was looking down into the room, you know. Uh, this went on for a good long while. Part of the meaning behind Ill Illegal Smile is that staring off into space like that, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't... Yeah. It, the song soon got a, yes, it got uh, a reputation <laughs> smoking marijuana. Mm. But um, at first that's what it was about. It was, I'd just be walking down the street with a kind of a half grin on my face because my little world was fine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I called him the illegal smile. That opening line of, of that song, I, I woke up this morning, it, it ends, he, he got stared down by a bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> a bowl of oatmeal tried to stare me down and it won. That's like your typical case of your Mondays right there. I don't know many other people that, that can take um, sort of these pedestrian everyday elements and elevate them to this like sense that is just hilarious and so sharp in terms of its observation. You know, I think that he was just really in tune with like the day-to-day -day details that a lot of us don't even think about. It was a song about uh, smiling. Uh, it's an old song wrote it about four years ago. Uh, around the time I wrote it, I was writing a whole bunch of songs about death, you know, just knocking them out, you know, one right after another, death, 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 death. <laughs> so I figured this might be a challenge. It's about smiling uh, illegally, because that's as close as I get to, uh, to smiling at all right at the time. It's kind of a sing-along song uh, in, of sorts. I didn't originally intend it to be a sing-along song. 
because uh, they tend to make me nervous. Uh, I just uh, never been able to tell uh, people to uh, come on, everybody. You know. So the uh, only reason I know this one might be a sing along song is because uh, uh, a couple of years ago I heard some people uh, singing along with it. <laughs> But it lasts a long while Won't you please tell the man I didn't kill anyone No, I'm just trying to have me some fun Well done, hot dog bun My sister's a nun Blow up your TV, throw away your paper If possible, please <laughs> <laughs> That's one, um, um uh, I had, uh I had to these two lines I had. Uh, she was a level-headed dancer on the road to alcohol, and I was just a soldier on my way to Montreal. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to uh, mix those two. I wanted to mix like uh, politics and romance, you know, mm -hmm. up together, you know, and see what come out of it. She was a level-headed dancer on the road to alcohol, and I was just a soldier on the way to Montreal. Well, she pressed her chest against me About the time the jukebox broke Yeah, she gave me a peck on the back of the neck And these are the words she spoke Blow up your TV Throw away your paper Go to the country Build you a home I mean, it's about blowing up your TV You know, going out and living in the sticks with, you know and it's like a romantic idea. And I always thought like Spanish stuff was romantic. So I called it a Spanish pipe drive. I should have just called it Blow Up Your TV because the word ain't that's Spanish it, or the word That's what everybody drive, calls it anyway, like, Blow Up Your TV. I know. I'm, I'm, I was telling the guys in the band, I, I'm just going to stop naming songs and just wait till somebody goes, hey, sing that song, you know, about blowing up your TV or something, and then name it then. And if they don't ask for it, I won't cut it. <laughs> it always struck me as it was a great piece of good philosophy you know blow up your tv <laughs> throw away your papers and eat a lot of peaches it's all good stuff you know I, I love that song i've played that many times and you know before i had kids it was like kind of always the really it was the spanish pipe dream <laughs> i mean what is that but not the dream that's the dream right that's like my whole motto for my life is the Spanish pipe dream. I love that. He would open the show with it sometimes, or a lot of times. It was like, this is the night is starting right. I got planted a whole whole row of peach trees in his honor. Plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches, try and find Jesus on your own. Well, I sat there at the table and I acted real naive For I knew that topless lady had something up her sleeve Is he in that song singing about uh, like a stripper woman? How they were written or the stories about how they came to be in existence and then and, and the way they changed for the writer and then, then the way they changed for the listener. That's a kind of beautiful thing about it. Like when I hear it, I don't think about the lady so much anymore as I think about the the beauty and, and the dream, you know, and then taking yourself back to the things that matter most, like family and nature, and then teaching your own kids those same things and those same values. And um, I mean, at the same time, it's funny and it's true to life, you know. I wonder what it'll be like next year. <laughs> Maybe it'll be all strippers. <laughs> The way that I interpret it is, you know, his younger brother, Billy, he kind of got really into the hippie movement. When Billy was growing up, he had long hair and he was playing in like electric blues bands in Chicago, like bar bands. Um, and he would talk to his family about how he wanted to move to a commune, um, things like that. He was a little bit of the rebel in the family. Um, and so for me, Spanish Pipe Dream is John's song for Billy. I think he's satirizing his hippie little brother a little bit. I do think there is like a level of satire there for sure. And, you know, like the 
the hippies and the cowboys were two definitely very different crowds at that time, I imagine. But like John floated the line between all of it. Yeah, Spanish Pipe Dream too is like one of the most like simple, beautiful songs that I, you know, I think a lot of people wish that they could write that song. And I've had a lot of friends that like go through that, like that prime phase where everything they do sounds so much like John. And it's always really good because, you know, he inspires that, but it's just so quintessentially prime that I think, yeah, a lot of people can try to rip it off, but smart writers will know where it's coming from. (laughs) And to this very day we've been living our way Here is the reason why we blew up our TV Through our paper Went to the country Built us a home Had a lot of children Fed them on peaches They all found Jesus On our own I very rarely write a tune before I write the lyrics to it. Usually they just both come at the same time. But I had this tune, and I was going to write a love song. And I sat down and I just wrote it. I had this song about old people. Oh, I don't know what to say. I think it's, I, I, I think it's going to be a classic. I think that that just is also another song. It's like, how could that be on someone's first record? So just have that kind of scope. And and even as a young person at the time, you know, I think he was just like, he was kind of this old soul in a way. And he just had, had a special way of looking at the world. And I think it really showed you like a glimpse inside of his mind that he just had a lot of compassion and he knew how to put that into words. And that was the one I think that, Christopherson made a, a great comment about uh, was was hello in there, and you know he, he said you know, how can a kid his age have that much understanding of old folks? One of the things that that's always stuck in my mind with John was he was really into people. All of his songs were inspired by something that he lived through with with other people. Uh, Hello in there came from, uh, at one point, he had a paper route and he delivered papers to, among other things, an old folks home in Maywood. And going in there and and meeting these people and talking to them, and he wrote that song. And, uh, And it's just astounding to hear somebody that was his age when he wrote that song writing something like that. That was heartbreaking. And he wrote that so young, like, you know, his dream was to be an old person, right? He said that a lot. When I was little, um, uh, old people used to take to me real fast for some reason. And uh, I used to take to them real fast. And uh, I always spent a lot of time with my with my grandfather. He's a carpenter. And uh, well, for a while there, I delivered papers uh, in an old people's home. And uh, it kind of reminded me of a tomb, you know. <laughs> it wasn't, it was just very depressing. And you know, it, was, it was a better, more supposedly one of the better, I mean, uh, it was a private institution, I believe. They just uh, sat around and, uh, yeah. oh, I imagine they had recreation for yeah. them. And some of them yeah. were, but uh, most of them mm. just seemed like they were kind of just waiting what? around to uh, die. Well, it's been years since the kids had grown. A life of their own Left us alone John and Linda 
live in Omaha And Joe is somewhere on the road We lost Davy in the Korean War And I still don't know what for Don't matter anymore This is a song where war appears and that's a prominent theme on this album, right? Because John had just kind of experienced uh, war and military service and he sort of like saw the futility in it, right? And I think that that is very poignantly expressed in Hello in There, but it's just, it's so, it's so spare and it's so elegant in its sparseness. And another thing I love about this song um, is that I feel like Prine isn't really speaking for the people. He's sort of like allowing them to speak for themselves. And I, I just love that. Yeah, that song is one that I love to hear him sing too. And just the specific details and and how he, you know, weaves in their children and like just this kind of really sad picture that he paints of this like old couple and the kids are gone and, and maybe they've fallen out of love. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people were like writing about <laughs> writing from that perspective again, you know, but it was just like such untapped territory and he did it so well. You know that old trees just grow stronger and old rivers grow wilder every day. People just grow lonesome Waiting for someone to say Hello in there oh. When I wrote this song, um, I don't think I approached it as that I thought I was going to write a song about old people. I heard uh, John Lennon sing uh, the song Across the Universe. And there was a bit of echo on his voice and the guitar. And I listened to the song about 20 times in a row, and I thought, man, it sounds so native. It uh, really sounds like you're singing through a hollow log or something. And I was thinking about, uh, you know, what you would say if you stuck your head in that hollow log. Like, you know, hello, hello in there, you know? And that developed in to a song about old people. <laughs> that's, that's the process there. <laughs> the story that I love um, about Rudy from this song is Rudy was a dog that lived across the street from Prine and Ann Carroll when they lived in Melrose Park right after they got married. And Prine uh, would be home after work and he would hear Rudy's dog mom, you know, call him in every night. She'd go, Rudy! <laughs> And so he was like, oh, I got that. I got that. And he wrote it down. Um, and Rudy became a character in the song. So, so yeah, I think it's like, um, you know, slyly political, right? Like kind of like his feelings about war. And it's also like his brilliance with sort of capturing the everyday and, and transcending it into like something very poetic. His tunes are fairly straightforward. They're not real complicated. Typically, uh, three chords does the job occasionally an extra one but usually but then the words uh, you know he was at an early age he was a very awesome poet i mean you, got, you, you listen to the words and i always thought john could say more in one line than most people can do in a couple of paragraphs yeah just the details all the all the names loretta and you know he just had a a way of really like kind of writing a, an entire novel in a short amount of words. Me and Loretta, we don't talk much more. She sits and stares through the back door screen. And all the news just repeats itself like some forgotten dream. That we both seen Someday I'll go and call up Rudy We work together
together at the factory. A life long and well lived, all those experiences. Um, but then thinking about how we kind of don't see these folks in the world when we're walking around looking or considering what that must be like, just assuming all old people can't hear or that they're become less important. That song to me is kind of like, makes me hope that other people see old people different when they hear that song. And I think that's probably what he was doing. So if you're walking down the street sometime, spot some hollow ancient ass. Please don't just pass them by and stare as if you didn't care. Say hello in there. Hello. It's uh, one of my personal favorite songs. It's uh, uh, come back to me in spades over the years, you know, and um, I always, even since, uh, ever since I can remember, uh, I always liked old people, you know. I hope to be one someday. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Stone came home to his wife and family after serving in the conflict overseas. And the time that he served had shattered all his nerves and left a little shrapnel in his knee. Did you know Sam Stone? Uh, no, it just rhymed with home. Huh? It just rhymed with home. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> Did you know somebody who was a Sam Stone? Uh, well, it was more or less, uh, uh, um, I was just kind of disillusioned after I got out of the army, you know, and uh, that's what it started out to be, and, and uh, that's the way the song fell together. He was driving around the Chicago western suburbs, delivering the mail, with like nothing to do but think. You know, Prime tells stories, and Anne Carroll told stories about him like busting in the door after work to write things down so he wouldn't forget, you know, um, that's how Sam Stone came into the world. Um, he had kind of thought it up in his truck and came running in the door after work and couldn't find anything. So he grabbed an insert from a pair of pantyhose um, <laughs> and, and wrote the lyrics to Sam Stone down on that, that cardboard insert. I wrote that one. I remember writing it on the mail route. I couldn't wait to get home that day so I'd get the guitar out and see if it actually works on a guitar. One thing he would say about this song is that he did not intend to write about um, a veteran addicted to heroin, right? Like obviously he had experience in the service and then the idea of this person battling with addiction and kind of being left behind was sort of the saddest thing that he could think of at the time. And that really fit the feeling and the sentiment of the song. And so that's kind of where he went with it. I didn't sit down to write a song about, uh, uh, about a veteran on uh, heroin. It was just the two, uh, the two things uh, like, well, heroin, uh, Usually doesn't end any place, and uh, and it was kind of uh, there's kind of a just a, a futile feeling, you know, when you're in the service. Uh, I wasn't in Vietnam. I was uh, they sent me to Germany for two years, and uh, but the throughout the whole army, even when you're in over in Germany, it was just. Uh, uh, you didn't feel like you're doing too much there, like you had no business there. And uh, it was that plus the image of somebody on heroin, and that's the only reason I combined the two more more than trying to write a song about it, a veteran on heroin yeah. in it. And uh, it was kind of strange that, that it ended up. Now there's a lot of them on heroin. Yeah. But the morphine eased the pain And the grass grew around his brain And gave him all the confidence he lacked With a purple heart and a monkey on his back There's a hole in daddy's arm Where all the money goes 
Jesus Christ died for nothing, I suppose. I kind of discovered uh, the album that we did later on, you know, when some of the songs became very popular, you know. I, I barely remember there's a hole in daddy's arm where all the money goes. I mean, it's what line, you know, as a writer. I mean, I, I wasn't a writer at that point, but I really admired writers, you know. So, uh, yes, man, this guy's a great writer, you know. Oh, hey, what's the song? Sam Stone. You know, I, I understood the first line of Sam Stone came home to his wife and family, and I guess it was his daddy. Because there's a hole in daddy's arm where all the money goes. That's the only two lines I can remember in that song. And I don't know why they stuck with me, but for some reason they did. I had those two lines. That's what started the whole song off, was I had that, that sweet song, Never Last Long, Broken Radios, and there's a hole in Daddy's Arm where all the money goes. And I was kind of thinking of, uh, in a way, uh, like some uh, political cartoon, like the humor they use in political cartoons. Uh, and I had, I had just kind of a picture of a, of a, of a fellow uh, uh, shooting money into his arm, you know, with like a rainbow of money just falling down into his arm, and that's where that's where I got that line. The rest of the song mm. developed out of it. It seems yeah. uh, it seems if the first couple of ideas of the song, mm. right, then I don't have as hard a time. Like that was one yeah. of the easiest songs I ever wrote. Really? Because after yeah. I had that those two lines, I, the rest of the song just poured out of it. Every time I saw John perform that song live, you know, usually I'd be standing side stage and it would just bring tears to my eyes every time. Some people could spend their whole life trying to write a song like that and never even like touch it. But yeah, it's, I mean, Sam Stone is like the perfect example of being able to put a mirror up to the human experience and make it something that like, that everybody can relate to and everybody can understand. You know, it's, is it an anti-war song? Yeah, probably. But, you know, a lot of people wouldn't look at it that way because it's just so personal and you just get such a vivid picture of, of who he's talking about. And it's both sympathetic to, you know, it's a, it's an anti-war song, but it's also just this very personal ballad and, you know, shows you kind of how people are treated in that experience. That's probably the most powerful song I've ever heard about a returning vet from Vietnam or any, any badass war like that. Uh, it just, you, you, it really strikes home. Again, one of those really poignant, um, touching songs about everyday people, right? Because this happens all the time in America, but no one had spotlighted it. Um, he was really the first person to do it. And he toyed with controversy with this song, right? But it resonated with people because he was illuminating something that needed to be illuminated. And that was sort of his brilliance. And again, he was like 20 years old when he was writing um, these songs, which is crazy to think about. That's my all time favorite. Like every time on the road, we'd play that song or he'd play that song. I'd cry. I've got more videos of that song on my phone than any other song. I relate to that so much. Um, my cousin, who was more like a brother to me, Michael Ruark, um, came back after six tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, and suffered from PTSD and um, took his own life. But um, like the the way that he described coming back from from that situation, like it it, it just it was exactly the same thing as what um, my cousin went through. And it, it also strikes me that 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 song could be as relevant then and. Um, like, we haven't learned anything, really. Like, um, you know, illegal smile. Drugs are legal now. But we still have the same problems when it comes to how we treat our soldiers and, and the return. It's a tragedy that that song is still so important, but I'm grateful that it exists, you know. Sam Stone's welcome home Didn't last too long He went to work when he'd spent his last dime And Sammy took to stealing When he got that empty feeling For a hundred dollar habit Without overtime And the gold rolled through his veins Like a thousand railroad trains Eased his mind in the hour that he 
chose While the kids ran around wearing other people's clothes Me and about six of my buddies all got drafted at the same time, January 66. That was about the time they went from 20,000 troops in Vietnam to 500,000, you know? And they said it was still a conflict. <laughs> we were just over there <laughs> protecting things, like half a million troops. But we all got drafted and they sent some of us to Vietnam. I, they sent me to Germany and a couple of, one of the other guys to Germany too. And some of them they kept in the States. But when we all got out uh, a couple of years later, uh, everybody had changed quite a bit. You know, a lot of changes. This was the end of 67, beginning of 68. And uh, I couldn't quite piece it together what was so different about it, whether it was just being away and growing up or something or or what. But like uh, a lot of the guys had come home from Nam and I had a buddy come home from Germany a uh, month after he got out. I, I called his house and he was in a veterans hospital having shock treatments. You know, he just went bananas. And uh, I, kn I knew it when I seen all of his shoes was pointed the same way under his bed that he wasn't really out of the army. You know, had those hangers on the right way. I said, oh, oh he's in trouble. Somebody blew rapidly right now, he'd run out the window. And uh, a couple of the other guys just had, had, had drug problems and stuff. And of course, I don't, I believe that just about everybody knew a brother or a husband or a son or something that didn't come back at all. But a lot of the ones that came home, it never seemed like they came back. You know, they, a lot of them still ain't home. And uh, there were no parades or nothing. You know, and all of all of us, I'm 38 now, but all of us kind of grew up with Audie Murphy movies and stuff like that. And I used to jump on, after I saw the Helen back, I passed an Oldsmobile car lot on the way home and I jumped up on the hood and I shot everybody on the street, you know. But when our work comes along, all of a sudden they just want to be ashamed of it and ain't got no parades or nothing. So it was kind of weird. I wrote that song to kind of explain it to myself, you know, what the feeling was. But life, it lost its fun and there was nothing to be done But trade his house that he bought on the G.I. Bill Four flag draped casket on a local hero's hill There's a hole in daddy's arm where all the money goes Christ died for nothing, I suppose. Little pitchers have big ears, don't stop to count the years. Sweet songs never last too long on broken radios. Mm -hmm. It's just like 101 in songwriting. If anybody wants to think about writing, a topical song like go listen to Sam Stone and then probably put the guitar down and realize you're never gonna be that good. When I was a child, my family would travel down to western Kentucky where my parents were born. And there's a backwards old town that's often remembered so many times that my memories are worn. And daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County? Down by the Green River, where paradise lay Well, I'm sorry, my son, but you're too late in asking Mr. Peabody's coal train has hauled it away I think just about anybody in the current Americana realm, myself included, Tyler, Sturgill, I think we have all tried to rip that song <laughs> That's a song that just feels like it seeps into your bones and it, and it stays there, you know? And it's like, it's, it's an earworm too. It just like has that hook that is so memorable, but it's just, it's like the perfect little folk song. He wrote that song for my father. He had played a bunch of his songs for my father. and Dad said, oh, those are nice. He said, but you got to do something that's more Kentucky. My father, they grew up down there. You're from Muhlenberg County, aren't you? No, my mother and father come from there. And um, me and my brothers were all raised up near Chicago, Maywood, Illinois. But uh, we used to return to Muhlenberg County a lot when I was a kid. That song, I think, makes everybody think that he is from Kentucky. 
because of Muhlenberg County, but I'm always like, no, John is from Illinois. You know, makes me really proud to be from Illinois too, because I always just thought it was like middle of nowhere. And I, a lot of people used to give me shit for like not being born in the South or or whatever. And I was like, hey, John Prine's from Illinois. It's <laughs> good enough for me. Yeah, I think it gave voice to an entire population of people that are often ignored or dismissed, you know, like, um, especially in today's climate, we tend to paint the middle of the country with in broad strokes, which I think is really tragic, because it really erases a lot of the nuance and a lot of um, the diverse perspectives and lives of that region. Um, And I think that Prine saw that, you know, I I don't think that his Chicago upbringing, his suburban Chicago upbringing, totally jibed with his family members in Western Kentucky, like I'm sure they disagreed on some things. But really, you know, it's about a spirit of family and about um, that spirit of love of family that transcends these issues that we've sort of gotten away from. And I think that this song recalls a time where society wasn't that way. And I think it's really special. And I think that's why, you know, this song has become a standard, maybe more so than any other song on the album and bluegrass combos and and family pickers and, you know, folk musicians will often replace Muhlenberg County with um, their own county or their own, their own town, um, their own region, because I think its sentiment is so universal. This is a song about a small town in uh, western Kentucky. It uh, sits down in Muhlenberg County on the Green River. And the name of the town was uh, Paradise. My mother and father were born and raised down there. Uh, they got married when I was about uh, 17 and moved to Chicago. Uh, so my father gets some work. They raised me and my brothers up there, but they always kept me and they'd go back uh, to Paradise. They'd they kept calling it to be home, you know, and uh, we ended up spending a lot of time traveling back and forth between uh, Chicago and Paradise. It was a, it was a pretty little place. Uh, there's only about like 48, 49 people living there, you know, at one time. Uh, they, were, they were all uh, relatives of mine. Too. Then we got a whole lot else to do besides uh, become relatives, you know. <laughs> I had a whole lot of fun down there. Me and my cousin used to go to this place. Uh, it's about half a mile down the river from Paradise. There's this old uh, abandoned uh, Civil War prison. Been uh, abandoned uh, since Civil War, you know. And we used to just uh, go up there and uh, we use our imaginations and kill each other about a thousand times a day. You know? <laughs> we made the mistake of telling this one aunt of ours that we've been playing by the prison. Uh, so when she found out that we were playing up there, she said, uh, said you boys uh, shouldn't go up on Adri Hill. Adri Hill is just crawling with snakes. There's snakes all over that place. If you ever go back up there again, take a pistol with you. And if you smell anything that smells like uh, cucumbers, uh, start shooting. <laughs> We were pretty scared. <laughs> we stayed away from there for about a week. And, uh, our curiosity got us. So that we went on back up there. It's about a 20 minute ride by boat to get there. And, uh, we didn't talk to each other hardly at all going up there this time. You know? By the time we got up there, uh, Everything smelled like uh, cucumbers. You know? Well, sometimes we travel right down the Green River to the abandoned old prison down by Adri Hill, where the air smelled like snakes and we'd shoot with our pistols. But empty pop bottles was all we would kill. And Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County Down by the Green River where Paradise lay The recording was done in Memphis. And um, they, when they got to Paradise and they needed a fiddle player, they brought this guy in from the Memphis Symphony, who was obviously an awesome violinist. And uh, he laid down a track and... Uh, then uh, John came back here with the original rough cut of the recording, and 
uh, he played it for my father. And my father looked at him and said, that's got to be Dave. <laughs> and so that is how it happened. So then next I had to go, uh, I had to go to a studio in Chicago and dub it. And uh, for me, this was a totally new experience. I'm, I'm a totally self-taught old time fiddler. And I'm used to sitting on my back porch and playing with my banjo picker. <laughs> and so going into a studio is a whole different animal. And before I could do that, I had, I had to join the musicians union. Uh, so I took my fiddle and I went downtown to the musicians union. And they kind of looked at me like I'd come from a different planet. But I guess as long as I was willing to pay the dues, I was a member. So I became a union member. <laughs> and then I had to go to the studio. And that was a bit of a challenge because I never tried to play with a pair of headphones on. Because <laughs> the fiddle goes here and the headphones are in the way. But it worked. I got in the booth and I played it two or three times and they picked the one they wanted. And that's the one that ended up on the record. And uh, there it is in all of its uh, scratchy Kentucky glory. <laughs> when, I, when I go back and listen to it now, I think, my God, that's really primitive, isn't it? <laughs> then the coal company came with the world's largest shovel and they tortured the timber and stripped all the land well they dug for their coal till the land was forsaken then they rode it all down as the progress of man my father was a um, loved country and western music and uh, when i learned how to play the guitar he would uh, i'd sit in the kitchen and he'd ask me to play hank williams and roy cuff songs and Jimmy Rogers songs, Webb Pierce. And um, so when I got around to writing, when I was away in the army, my dad sent me a letter telling me that uh, Peabody Cole had uh, bought up what was left of the town, moved the people out and tore the town down because they were gonna strip mine where the town was. And uh, <clears throat> the joke was <laughs> the people sold their houses to them, but everybody knew that there's nothing there except sulfur and uh <laughs> it took peabody uh 20 years and millions of dollars to find out that there wasn't any coal right where the town was yeah and, that's great some people think of paradise as like a parable or something but it's actually a real true account of the events that took place in paradise kentucky that sort of ruined the charm of this uh historic town this energy company moved in they began strip mining the area, um, which is a much more destructive form of mining than like the tunneling version of mining. Um, they basically like strip away huge chunks of land and completely kind of render the landscape, you know, unrecognizable. And so that's what Prine is detailing in that song, um, sort of the destruction of this, this town and this area that his family's from and that his dad loved with all of his being. Um, Prine always talked about how his dad raised him to know like a uh, that he was a pure Kentuckian, right? The last of a dying breed. Like um, they were really proud of, of those Southern roots. The longing for a home that doesn't exist anymore. Like, I don't really have that experience, but it makes me so sad to think about, you know, when I think about like, what if that happened and there was no Mineral Wells, Texas anymore and, or, or what I know of it, not just like a small change, but like, there's not really anything anymore there that it's just that it kind of makes me really sad but um i think that's the point of it but then i also wonder if that was to show that we're all connected to the places that we're from so after he went to memphis and recorded his album basically he didn't have like a test pressing or anything yet so he brought the reel the tape reel that the album was on home so he could play paradise for his dad so his dad could hear it and um yeah Bill Ryan, he wasn't a very demonstrative man, like he could keep things close to the vest, right? And so 
Um, I think that he swelled up with emotion and he told John, his, you know, his son, uh, I'm going to go listen from the next room so I can pretend I'm listening to it on the jukebox. But really, you know, he didn't want his son to see him crying. He died in August of 71. Much, much, much too young. He was, he was about 10 days short of being 56 years old, which is awful. And it was, a, it was a brutal shock to all of us. He did get to hear the final mix, I think. But, it, but the album itself had not come out. I, re, I remember that was, that was one of the remarks I made when that awful thing happened. I said, geez, he's never going to get to, to hear the, the album. You know, have an autographed copy of it and so on. When I die, let my ashes flow down the Green River Let my soul roll on up to the Rochester Dam I'll be halfway to heaven with paradise wait Just five miles away from wherever I am And Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County Down by the Green River where paradise lay well, I'm sorry, my son, but you're too late in asking. Mr. Peabody's cold train has hauled it away. For folks that have a little bit more of a quirky singing voice or, you know, straddle the lane of different genres and different sounds, I really try to, to point to him as like a light of morality and to not get lost with gimmicks or by making flashy, shitty pop music. And, you know, John is like, he stayed true to his vision and, and it, I'm sure it wasn't always easy, but it allowed him to remain inspired his whole life and to like never put out any crap. I mean, he just seemed like he followed the muse he didn't try to abide by any formula. He didn't limit himself by the instrumentation he was going to use. He didn't try to fit into any mold because he couldn't. And I think, you know, he always was so humble. He never like knew how good he was. And just even, you know, hearing that he was like nervous around those folks. I mean, I can, I can get it, you know, I can get that he was nervous because it's not like he sang like Elvis or anything, but those players just like added so much and and because his songs were so strong and they were so memorable, he didn't have to be worried about it. I got a friend in Freeman, he sells used cars, you know. Well, he calls me up twice a year just to ask me how to go pretty good not bad i can't complain but actually everything is just about the same this song to me sonically rings sort of of an experiment it's sort of like Roger Miller on Quaaludes or something. It, it sort of stands out in the in the track listing of this album. I love that song. Um, it's just written so smart where you've got this like simple kind of phrase that he repeats. And then he allows himself to kind of take himself anywhere with the rest of the first lyrics. I mean, that one's just perfect. They're all perfect. Every line of that song also goes with another line of that song, like all of his songs. You could take them apart, you can put them together, you could rearrange them, and it all goes together. You know how, like, when you write a song and everything relates to another thing in the song? That's not easy to do. Yeah, I think the thing to know about this song is um, the Prine family took annual fishing trips to Arkansas, um, and they went with a family, another family that was kind of a friend of theirs. And so this section about Molly, the dog, is actually, I think, drawn from a real experience. And Carol talks about it a little bit, that she sort of remembered vacationing in Arkansas on these fishing trips with a family that had a dog named Molly. So yeah, it's another instance of prime drawing from real life experience, even though he does get a little, a little experimental in this one, which I think is an interesting mode for him because it doesn't happen too often. That was actually some friend of his. They always said that, pretty good, not bad. You know, that, <laughs> again... 
I had a good friend and we, we were out one time with a bunch of people and they were asking about John. And this guy said that he hit the nail on the head. He said, you want to know about John? Listen to the words of the song. You will learn everything there is to learn. <laughs> and, and it was true. I mean, all, every song he did, you could ask him about where it came from and he'd relate. There was some experience that he been through you know and it is you know it's about it's about the groove but it's a funky groove with poetry over top of it it's dylan s but i think i think john was like one of the only other people that could be put into that category you know with up there with with dylan and, and Joni mitchell and you know there's just such a small group of people who had that range really the fact that he gets a little experimental at the end, I think is kind of interesting, but yeah. yeah, it's like, is this John Pryde on acid? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I heard Allah and Buddha were singing at the Savior's feet And up in the sky, an Arabian rabbi fed Quaker Oats to a priest Pretty good Not bad, they can't Sing with me, this is a, an old spiritual. Make your socks roll up and down. <laughs> well, digesting, Reader's Digest, in the back of the dirty bookstore. A plastic flag with gum on the back fell out on the floor. Well, I picked it up and I ran outside, slapped it on my window shield. And if I could see old Betsy Ross, I'd tell her how good I feel. I was a postman in Westchester, Illinois, and uh, one of the publications that all of us mailmen at the time really disliked was Reader's Digest. And the reason being, uh, Reader's Digest were small as a letter, but they were thick. And so you had to, you couldn't put them with your magazines. You had to carry them like you would your letters. And with about five or six Reader's Digest, you had a bundle of mail. So instead of having, say, 17 bundles of mail for your whole mail route, you would have about 213 when you had Reader's Digest because they were so fat. And... Uh, <laughs> we didn't like to see them come, and at one time, they were kind of like the Columbia Record Club. <laughs> you, <laughs> you got Reader's Digest. If you just stopped and picked it up in the dentist office, you'd subscribe to it, you know? <laughs> and so just about everybody got a Reader's Digest. So one month, this was around 1969, for no particular reason, they gave every customer uh, a decal of the American flag that was just about the size of the Reader's Digest. And I thought, wow, that's really odd. There was no explanation whatsoever. They didn't say, this is for you because we feel strongly about this. Or they just put it in there. Next day, I went on my mail route. Stickers were everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Bumpers of cars on front doors, on mailboxes. And they weren't just put on. They were like, <laughs> like that, like that ought to show them, you know. <laughs> so I wrote this song. But your flag to cow won't get you into heaven anymore. They're already overcrowded from your dirty little war. Now Jesus don't like killing, no matter what the reason's for. And your flag to cow won't get you into heaven anymore the other thing that that he has is a a very wry sense of humor and he's able to write a protest song and slip that humor in and you don't even realize he's, he's protesting something until you go back and listen very carefully I think the wit of it, too, is a way to teach without 
actually anybody knowing that you're teaching them anything, just to, to think about something from a different person's side. At that point in the, in the 60s, uh, a lot of guys wrote, wrote protest songs and they just kind of stood there and told you how mad they were <laughs> over and over again. Usually protest songs are written, they're self-serving. They're written for that crowd that already agrees with you, you know, so you're preaching to the choir. If that's what you set out to do as a songwriter, I would say mostly you you would fail, you know. Um, you got you to gotta keep uh, in mind that politics don't come first even for the people that, whose politics you don't like. So maybe they got the same kind of white shirt on you do, you know? That might be your song, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're looking for the big picture, you got to get a really small frame sometimes, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that he just kind of saw right through a lot of this puritanical Americanism, right? Especially like during the Nixon era, that just rang false to him. And so I, I just love that he is kind of uh, very slyly and sweetly skewering <laughs> these things. Um, and that I think that's indicative of, of his like political nature, too. Like later on in life, Prime would insist that he's not a very political person. Um, but if you talk to Dave and Billy, like they would insist otherwise, like their dad was like a big Roosevelt Democrat, you know, they grew up in Chicago, which is a democratic stronghold. Dave was a precinct captain for a while for the democratic party. Like they, they very much grew up in this era of like working class rights, um, and social inclusion. Like that was like a big part of the fabric of their being as a family. And so we hear that. And I, I think that Prine was smart, you know, he didn't want to alienate any of his fans. Right. He didn't want to make anyone feel left out, which I think is kind of strategically smart. And also like the way that he felt as a human being. Right. I think that's the person who he was. Um, so I think he was very sly in sort of inserting his opinions, particularly on politics and, and social issues. But this is an example of that for sure. That might have been one of the songs he played for me the first time I heard him play. Yeah, that's a that's a great song. I mean, <laughs> it's John. It's it. She's laying it on you, and and it's and it's sort of funny. It's got a lot of humor in it, you know. Stuck one right on his wife's forehead. Yeah, it's great. Well, I went to the bank this morning, and the cashier said to me, "If you join the Christmas club, we'll give you ten of them flags for free." Well, I didn't mess around a bit. I took him up on what he said. And I stuck them stickers all over my car And one on my wife's forehead But your flag cow won't get you Into heaven anymore They're already overcrowded From your dirty little war Flag the cow, jeez Man, I thought I hung that song out to dry. Yeah. You know? and, uh, yeah. And all I had to do was wait for this administration to come along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As the cafe was closing on a warm summer night. Kathy was cleaning the spoons The radio played The hit parade And I hummed along with the tune On the first album, one of my very favorite songs, and I learned much later in life that it was also one of his favorite songs, uh, was Far From Me, that very country song. I like that he likes that. I, di I didn't know that that was one of his favorites. I would have guessed that that in like the sadder ones, like Summers in, you could just feel it when he when he sang it, that the emotion was always there. He makes you feel like you're not in the world alone, you know, because every experience, he's not afraid to go into any of them. So this song is drawn from a childhood experience in the Chicago suburbs. Prine is basically detailing the heartbreak of his first breakup like with his very first girlfriend. 
again, it's drawn from everyday life, everyday people, which is a prime signature. But I, I love this song. I think it is like an Edward Hopper painting. You know, it's sort of like this lonely Americana. And yeah, I think it's drawn pretty directly from his experience with this girl that he broke up with. Uh, this song here, I kind of wrote about this, uh, the first girl that ever broke my heart. You know, that would make a songwriter out of you right away, you know. She gave me my ring back and uh, told me that she thought maybe it needed some work done on it. <laughs> and I believed her. Yeah, this was a girl that worked. Um, there was a little restaurant on Fifth and Madison that he used to go to and get burgers. And she worked there. And he developed quite a crush on her. And then she, she dumped him. And that, that song, I mean, what guy hasn't been dumped by a girl that he got a crush on? And it's spelled, it's perfect. I mean, it's, you can, it, anybody can relate to that thing. She still laughs with me, but she waits just a second too long. <laughs> Great lie. While we used to laugh together And we danced to any old song Well, you know, she still laughs with me But she waits just a second too long And the sky is black and still now on the hill where the angels sing Ain't it funny, our old broken bottle Looks just like a diamond ring But it's far, far from me And the sky is black and still now On the hill where the angels sing Ain't it funny how an old broken bottle Looks just like a diamond ring that image is also drawn from the Western suburbs. Prine talks about as a kid, he would go to a nearby junkyard and sort of break bottles um, just for fun, kind of messing around as a boy. Um, and then there were also this effect in the sidewalks in the area. The concrete would sort of sparkle because it had some sort of element in it that, that made it kind of look like a series of diamond rings. Um, so that's where that comes from. And so, yeah, it's just this amalgamation of all of these um, boyhood feelings and experiences dropped into just a really profound song. First time I heard that song, I thought, my God, John, you've written the absolutely perfect country song. I can hear George Jones doing that song. And many years later, I said to John, how come, how come George never did that song? And he says, well, he says, we, we shopped it to him and he came back and said it had too many words. <laughs> At times, you know, he was he was writing those like standard country songs and he could, you know, songs like that. And like I was saying, Unwed Fathers, where it's like you could hear someone with a voice like Merle Haggard singing those songs. But, um, you know, he did it so effortlessly. And, you know, I, I think, too, it's like he never limited himself on what was going to be on an album because you would have a song like Donald and Lydia next to Far For Me, and it's like, all right, this could be sung kind of by almost anyone in Nashville. It's got this fantastic pedal steel in it that was Leo LeBlanc. And he said, we got to get a pedal steel in this. And they had no idea what the hell a pedal steel was. <laughs> this was, this was out of the picture. And so they, they, I don't know how they found it, but they got Leo LeBlanc and he came in and that, and that's his steel playing is one of the things that really, really works in that song. We didn't know how to play country music when we were down in Memphis or the or the uh, Nashville Sound. You know, we had we had not a clue what they were doing. I, you know, we had had to learn it when we got here, but it was totally different than the way we did records in Memphis. Yeah, that that um, pedal steel player is Leo LeBlanc, and he wasn't part of the Memphis Boys. He was a hired gun. He was a guy that had just come to the area from Bakersfield, actually. Um, and I think Arif Mardron brought him in thinking like, okay, well, this is a signature of country music, right? Let's, let's try this. It was kind of an experiment, um, but I think it's beautiful. Well, I started the engine and I gave it some gas 
Kathy was closing her purse Well, we hadn't gone far in my beat-up old car And I was prepared for the worst Will you still see me tomorrow? No, I got too much to do Well, a question ain't really a question If you know the answer to This is about a, a woman thinking about her old man while he's at work Because she ain't got time to think about him when he's home <laughs> from Montgomery when the first line starts out I am an old woman and you hear the voice it's like that's the time when I realized that you could be somebody else in a song you know I really don't know that I ever heard somebody do it in switch gender you know oh, I love that um you know I think it's also like House of the Rising Sun or something where you're writing from this other perspective and it's like it's just really freeing to see a songwriter do that and to write from another perspective definitely kind of gave me license to feel like I could didn't have to write everything autobiographical, even though a lot of people want to think everything you write is true. And that is a song that kind of shows you like a great template for how to write a personal song about someone else or from someone else's perspective. I mean, here was a very unhappy older woman who's very fed up with her situation. And it's incredible. It's incredibly believable. And it was written... I don't know how old he was when he wrote that song, but my God. You know, the idea of this young guy, you know, this like 20 year old guy narrating the life of a middle aged woman who, you know, feels older than she is because of everything she's gone through in her life is again, like so profound, right? And so unexpected, but that's a part of his talent is like he could conceive of these characters and the characters aren't fanciful. They're like people that he feels like he could know, you know, they're everyday Americans. And he was able to sort of step inside of these worlds um, and relay them to people, you know, they heard themselves in the songs. Make me an angel that flies from Montgomery. Make me a poster of an old rodeo. Just give me one thing that I can hold on to To believe in this living is just a hard way to go Angel from Montgomery is a rite of passage. Any girl that picks up an acoustic guitar must learn Angel from Montgomery and sing it at an open mic just once. <laughs> And then when you hear like Bonnie Raitt sing it too, and you know, it like she embodies it. And it's, it's just so cool that he did that because there are so many songs that are like, you know, the opposite where it's like the woman is the muse. And, and, and so it's just, it's cool that he, that he could do that and yeah, showed everybody else that they could do it too. A mark of this album is Prine's deep empathy for other people that are unlike him, but that he connects to on a human level. Um, and Angel Montgomery, I think is maybe the pinnacle of that on this album. And what I love about this song too, is I think it is demonstrative of Prine's tacit feminism. I don't think that we think of feminism when we think of Prine, but in this song, he's allowing this woman to speak for herself, right? He's not narrating her experiences through like this third party male perspective. Um, he is stepping into her experiences in a very empathetic way and allowing her 
And by extension of that, like women in general speak for themselves. And I just love that about this song. By proxy of his experience growing up with his grandma and his mother um, and how close he was with them, his experience with all of these um, strong women in Western Kentucky growing up, these farmers who grew their own food and made their own clothes and, you know, raised the babies. Like, I think he had a deep empathy for the women around him um, and wanted to convey their experiences. And that comes out in this song in a really powerful way. And I think he said, I have a recording, he, he might have wrote that about his grandmother that he that used to give him sugar to wake up in the morning, two tablespoons of sugar, just shove it in his mouth. I think that's true. Sometimes, not with John, sometimes I think that um, men can't ever write women's characters right, but John did it right in that one. When I was a young girl, well, I had me a cowboy. He weren't much to look at, just a free rambling man. But that was a long time, and no matter how I try, the years just flow by like a broken down dam. The plain spoken way to tell your feelings and also keep people in the room with you by finding the details that that mean something in the moment like you know the, even the flies in the kitchen you would think how how am i going to sing those words in a song but the thing is if you stay with the intention and the emotion of the song and you're trying to show what this person's life is like you need the details for for everybody to feel like they can be in the room with you like a like a little movie if it's just full of abstractions and just feeling words and, no, and nothing to see, it's kind of hard to see it for yourself or you see yourself inside of that experience. Prine spent a lot of time in the home in Maywood, um, in this multi-generational family. And, you know, so things like the kitchen, things like the radio, I sort of think about this upbringing, this sort of like Norman Rockwell quality of that and how affecting that probably was to Prine because we see these pedestrian images um, that are so affecting and it's because it's universal. We're like, we all have that dad or that grandpa or that hardworking mother, right? And it just illustrates like um, the effectiveness of of writing what you know um, and like leaning on the universality of that. Yeah, that's such a special song and, you know, just kind of again shows his brilliance as a songwriter where he's like talking about flies buzzing and like, the, you know, maybe someone who's like, drinking themselves to death. And then he just opens up with this like beautifully poetic chorus that just seems so effortless. There's flies in the kitchen. I can hear them there buzzing. And I ain't done nothing since I woke up today. How the hell can a person go to work in the morning? Come home in the evening and have nothing to say. Make me an angel that flies from Montgomery. So um, one day, Ed Holstein, John Prine, um, and I believe Fred Holstein was there as well. Um, they were hanging out, and Ed thought maybe he and Prine could come up with a co-write. And Ed when I talked to him, he said, you know, I was thinking something, you know, like a little bit like there's a hole in daddy's arm, you know, like something sort of maybe a little controversial. Um, but but Prine had this line, I am an old woman. And Ed said, you know, that just didn't strike me at the time. I didn't know where he was going to go with that. Didn't sound like something that I would be interested in. So I passed on it. Um, <laughs> and of course, that line, I am an old woman turned into Angel from Montgomery. And I think Ed is sort of kicking himself to this day that he passed on it. But yeah, that's sort of the genesis of, of the song. Like Prine believed um, in this first line so much that he wrote the song that became a standard. I had a buddy uh, uh, a long time ago, he heard me sing a hello in there, a song about old people I wrote. He wanted to write a song with me and I like to watch this guy uh, eat. He would eat for hours, you know, you take him to lunch and pay for it just you couldn't believe how much this guy could eat <laughs> he was a songwriter too you know but so i said well what do you want to write about and uh, he said uh, well, let's write a song about old people 
And I said, but I just wrote hello in there. I said, that's everything I got to say about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, how about um, a song about a middle-aged woman who feels older than she is? And he goes, nah. <laughs> so <laughs> I went home and wrote Angel from Montgomery. <laughs> He's, he's still eating lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Strolling down the highway with my shoes in my hand I don't talk much, I'm a quiet man Beauty and silence both run deep And I'm running like crazy while you are asleep You got news for me I got nothing for you Don't pin your blues on me Just go ahead and do Whatever you wish to I just love this one because um, it's just Prine and his regular guy persona, right? I think, I think he's really just kind of reflecting on um, himself, sort of like Illegal Smile. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so it's so um, simple and lovely. Strolling down the highway with my shoes in my hand. I don't talk much. I'm a quiet man, right? Like that. That's exactly who Prine is. Um, and so I think he's just kind of meditating on that characteristic. When he was a young kid, way, way, way before this, when he was a young teenager, in fact, earlier than that, uh, he never had a lot to say. He was very quiet. And uh, it was years later that I finally figured out what he was doing. And that is, he was recording it all in his head. <laughs> he, would, he would sit in the room with a bunch of people talking and he wouldn't say two words, except that everything they said went into his head. He was like a, a pretty shy, quiet, introverted person. You know, he, he took a job as a mailman so he could drive around in a truck by himself, you know, <laughs> dropping off mail. Um, so yeah, to be sort of thrust into this setting with all these people um, who were big deals, who he didn't know. For Prine, it was an act of bravery, <laughs> you know, something that, you know, maybe he didn't necessarily want to be doing. Um, I think Goodman really encouraged him to kind of take these steps in his career. Like, for example, whenever Christofferson and Paul Anka came to see him play at the Earl of Old Town, and then Anka offered them plane tickets to New York, Prine you know, was reluctant. Uh, Steve Goodman told stories about how Prine was like, well, why would we do that? Well, he was like, you know, I, I'm doing fine here. You know, I have a fine career playing the clubs in Chicago. He was making, I think, $1,000 a week or something under the table um, as a performer. And he quit the postal service and, you know, he was happy as a clam. You know, he, he didn't understand why um, he should make himself uncomfortable, you know, going to New York and, and doing all these things. So, so yeah, Steve... Goodman um, was his champion and his motivator. And I think in the end, Prine realized that he shouldn't dismiss Goodman's goodwill, right? And so that's, that's why he was brave. That's why he stepped outside of his comfort zone and went to New York and went to Memphis. And so, yeah, I think without Steve Goodman, a lot of this wouldn't have happened. This is about people's problems. Uh... Sometimes it's nice, you know, if somebody comes up to me, you know, and they got a problem, you know, and I help them with it, you know, or they'll help me with my problems, but some people come up and they got all these problems, you know, and they tell them to you for about an hour and then they walk away laughing and you're stuck with their problems for the rest of the day. <laughs> so I wrote a song to explain to these people my position. It's an unusual one. Oodles of light, what a beautiful sight. Both the gods I Shining the night, raising beams of incredible dreams. Now, quiet man, oodles of light, what a beautiful sight. Both the gods' eyes are shining the night, raising beams of incredible dreams. Now, quiet man. Yeah, I loved like going to John's room after we would play shows. And he would just kind of sit there and, you know, he was, he would be pretty quiet and everybody would be partying or whatever in the room. But if you took the time to listen, 
he really did love to share about himself and he loved to tell old stories. And I was definitely always kind of prodding him for information. And, you know, I wanted to know details about certain songs. I wanted to know, you know, why he wrote this or if this line meant a certain thing. And um, you could get it out of him, but he was sensitive and he was thoughtful and, you know, he, he was quiet, but I think that he got out a lot of what he needed to say in his songs. Small town, bright lights, Saturday night, pinballs and pool halls flashing their lights, making change behind a counter in a penny arcade, set the fat girl daughter of Virginia and Ray. Lydia, Lydia hid her thoughts like a cat behind her small eyes, sunk deep in her fat. This is a song about a, uh, when I was in the army, these, uh, I was down in Louisiana most of the time, and uh, just about every army camp in the States has a small town uh, right near it, where all the soldiers go, and usually the whole thing's made up of, you know, saloons and maybe five or six saloons and a beauty parlor, and, and that's about it, usually. And uh, the people in these towns always kind of seemed, uh, seemed just a little bit different. It seemed like they had to put up with a different, uh, like almost like a tourist town, except off-season or something, because uh, the soldiers would come to town, but they never... None of them ever wanted to really be there. So they really didn't, uh, uh, they just really raised hell, you know, all the time. And uh, I got to thinking about the people who were living in these towns. So I wrote this as a, it's a love story. And uh, I usually say it's about, it's about a couple lovers that never met is what it is. It's about two people I picked and uh, they don't meet in the song at all. I think that one was written that, that was from experiences he had in the Army. I think he wrote that when he was over in Germany, which would have made him uh, uh, 19 years old, like that, 18, 19. You know, you, you, a lot of his songs, it's almost like watching a movie. You know, it, it gets, you can see it. You can see it, you can feel it. it. I don't think anybody wrote songs like that. There were spaces between Donald and whatever he said Strangers had forced him to live in his head He envisioned the details of romantic scenes After midnight in the stillness of the barracks, the train But dreaming just comes natural like the first breath from a baby Like sunshine feeding daisy Like the love hidden deep in your heart So I love this song because it's again, it's another example of Prime's just brilliance with characters. You know, Donald's a soldier. He's like lying in a sea of bunk beds, shaved heads, you know, that kind of situation. And then Lydia is someone who works in the nearby town. Um, and she's kind of this overweight loner um, who dreams of romance, right? And so he details these two sort of lonely people who maybe want love or want to be in love, who are sort of having these same thoughts, but who never meet. Um, and I think that's just beautiful and brilliant. Um, and again, he's giving voice to like these underdogs in our society, right? These two folks that like, um, we overlook, right? Who aren't celebrated in song. And it's uh, partially about uh, uh, masturbation too. Because I thought both these people were uh, uh, alone. I mean, uh, uh, mentally too, they, they spend a lot of time just with themselves. It's pretty controversial, right? But just the way that he delivers it is so charming. Um, that I, I don't think it stirred the pot too much in the end. But yeah, I mean, he says it. He says, you know, this is partly a song about masturbation, <laughs> um, which is like 
okay, you know, again, but it's a, it's another part of life that people don't really talk about. And he, at you know, 20 years old or whatever, had the bravery to sort of uh, explore that topic. I know he had such a sly way of like writing about stuff like that too, that it, a lot of people would probably just like fly right over their heads. And then a lot of other people, if they did get it, they would be like wildly offended. <laughs> but um, yeah, he just, he knew how to, how to turn a phrase. He knew how to twist words like other people didn't. There should be songwriting classes on how to make a sexual innuendo like disguised in John Prine speak. <laughs> Hot love, cold love, no love at all. A portrait of guilt is hung on a wall. Nothing is wrong, nothing is right. Donald and Lydia made love that night. Love. They made love in the mountains. They made love in the streams. They made love in the valleys. They made love in their dreams. But when they was finished, there was nothing to say. Cause mostly they made love. 10 miles away This is a song I wrote uh, geez, uh, quite a while ago uh, I don't know what I was thinking of when I wrote this uh, I think I was trying to write something so sad it was uh, pretty you know Wanda had a baby in 1951 father was a stranger and the stranger was the son call that child james lewis call his room a home changing all them diapers polish all that chrome come on baby spend the night with me so Prine had a friend growing up who was kind of a neighborhood kid in Maywood. And then years later, when they were teenagers, this friend of his was kind of always in trouble. Um, he'd end up in juvie. Um, and so he tells a story about how his friend was in court one day. Um, he'd gotten in trouble. And um, the prosecutor reveals to his friend and everyone in the courtroom that his father was his father but his mother was his oldest sister, which is so tragic. So yeah, he was like, you know, no wonder this kid was always in trouble. He has a troubled background, you know, that's, that's so tragic. And so he took that experience of this childhood friend that he had and translated it into this really powerful, tragic, sad song. God bless this kitchen, said the knickknack shelf. Dinner's almost ready Go and wash yourself well, Jimmy's growing up now Wanda's growing old The time is growing short The nights are long and cold He just had such a cool way of like, even if it was the saddest song, ever or there was like some turmoil between the characters or you know something going on like he could make it funny and and you need that in a life that is really dark and sometimes scary like it was cool that he could just say some you know two lines and like have have a complete joke there yeah, if you can learn to do that in your songwriting, like it's just going to be more enjoyable for yourself. It's going to be more enjoyable for your listeners. And he, yeah, he mastered it better than anybody, probably. You know, he was so emotionally intelligent and so just intelligent anyway and witty. I think people like that that are so smart and also so empathetic, a person like him with a big heart, I think sometimes the jokes and the wit are, are necessary to, otherwise you'd just, you know, be howling in agony and crying. 
that's one of those songs where you know they, it, there's there's all this sort of humorous stuff early in it, and then it hits you like a ton of bricks when <laughs> when it gets to the tail end. I mean, that ending is such a gut punch, but I think it relays um, sort of the gravity of the situation, you know. Sneaking in the closet through the diary. Now don't you know all he saw was all there was to see. The old town saw Jimmy on the six o'clock news. His brains were on the sidewalk. Blood was on his shoes. Baby, spend the night with me. You know, this is the album that has all of the classic songs, that has all of the songs that became standards and like some of his most beloved songs in his catalog. Um, and so for better or for worse, I think, you know, he he had to live with that. But I think in terms of the recording, it was difficult for him to listen to it because, you know, he was so young and inexperienced he didn't assert himself in the studio, right? He um, just kind of was along for the ride in a way. Um, so I think, you know, to him, maybe it sounded a little naive, um, a little bit, maybe not as professional as he would have liked it to sound. But I think he recognized its importance to his success, to his bravery at that point in his life. You know, he could have easily been a guy who just stayed in the Chicago suburbs, a mailman. You know, and he would have been content with that life, you know, to follow in his father's footsteps as a figure in in the Western suburbs. But it's such a turning point in his life that I think he did have a lot of respect um, for the album and for the events um, that informed it. And particularly, you know, the generosity of Chris Christopherson and the generosity of his best friend, Steve Goodman. window shopping through the path I ran across a looking glass reflecting moments remaining in a burned out life tragic magic prayers of passion stay the same through changing fashion to freeze my mind like water on a winter's night yeah, the thing I think that's important about this one is just, um, you know, Steve Goodman came to Memphis to sort of support his friend, um, and he ended up doing that acoustic guitar solo on this song. But Prine was playing this um, as early as The Fifth Peg when he's a performer there. He wrote this one somewhat early. I think it's great. It's playful. Um, there's so much gravity on this record that it kind of leaves you with a, with a bit of lighter air, <laughs> right? Um, and I think... Again, maybe, you know, he's meditating a bit on himself about how Prine always said he's really good at wasting time, right? He just loves to kind of cruise around and think and, you know, live in his brain. And so I think that that is illustrated here. Spent most of my youth at hobo cruising, right? Like he he didn't do that, but I, I think it's illustrative of like, you know, his quiet life in the suburbs and everything that he was observing and recording as this sort of guy just kind of cruising around observing the everyday. Spend most of the youth of whole bowl cruising and all I got for proof is rocks in my pockets and dirt in my shoes. A goodbye non-believer. Don't you know that I hate to leave here so long, babe? I got the flashback blue. Yeah, the cover of that album, it always made me laugh when I saw it. I mean, he it's like he looks comfortable, but also a little out of place, too. You know, it's like staged. He'd never seen hay before in his life. <laughs> then he had to look at that record for the rest of his life, him sitting in front of hay. That's the album cover. Is this photographer like trying to, to put him 
somewhere, which was the same struggle that sort of everyone had with Prine at the time. Um, but I mean, it's a really cute picture, you know, <laughs> he looks, he looks folksy and he looks, um, approachable and it sort of embodies the spirit of the album in a way. Um, but it is ridiculous because Prine grew up in a suburban environment, not on a farm. I could see it being like a, a marketing scheme and I could see a lot of people like not knowing what to do with John, you know, because it's like for those who get it, they completely get it. And, you know, he's, I hate the term, but it's like a songwriter, songwriter. So Prine and Goodman released debut albums, like within, I don't know, a few months of one another. And they helped each other with each other's albums. And it was, you know, very much this like serendipitous moment for these two friends. And so when their albums came out, Paul Anka had someone book like a short residency for them at the bitter end as sort of like the album release celebration. And so when that happened, Christofferson came to the shows. I think Bette Midler was there. Like uh, this whole coterie of like New York influencers were like excited about these two guys. And so, yeah, they met up with Christofferson and he was like, hey, we're going to go hang out at Carly Simon's house. And of course, these two guys from Chicago are like, oh, sure, you know, we'll we'll go party at Carly Simon's house. So, yeah, they went over and, um, you know, it's a bunch of songwriters sitting around hanging out. But then Prine tells the story, like all of a sudden there was a knock on the door and, you know, he didn't think much of it. He was just figured it would be just another random person that Chris Christopherson knows. But that random person happened to be Bob Dylan, right? Like um, they opened the door, it was Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan had been recovering from that motorcycle accident that he was in. He he hadn't really been appearing publicly. I think he'd done um, the concert for Bangladesh recently, but like not much else. Um, and so, I mean, they were shocked to see Dylan. And then, yeah, Dylan comes in um, and they engage in what's known as a guitar pull, which is like... Um, where you have one guitar and you kind of pass it around and, you know, everyone kind of sings a song. And um, Prine is singing his songs and then Dylan starts singing along with him. And and he's like, what? (laughs) You know, Bob Dylan knows my songs? Like, that's incredible. So yeah, Dylan had gotten like an advanced copy of the record from Jerry Wexler and and loved it and loved, loved Prine. He loved Goodman too. And yeah, that's kind of how that happened. Spend most of my youth out cold and all I got for proof is rocks in my pockets and dirt in my shoes. A goodbye, non believer. Don't you know that I hate to leave here so long, baby? I got the flashback blues. This album is the sound of a middle American region that doesn't get a lot of attention, right? That is sort of disregarded or discounted or, or painted with broad brushstrokes. Um, and I love that Prine brought his specific voice, um, the sound of someone whose family is from the country, but who grew up in a city, um, same as me, same as a lot of other folks who have family in the region. Um, and he brought that to worldwide audiences. You know, that's so important and it's so groundbreaking. Um, and he did that on the strength of Um, his own identity, which I think is really special. He never tried to be something that he's not. There's no one like Prine. There's no one that sounds like him. There's no one who can write like him. Many people have tried. As musical traditions go on, there will always be notable songwriters. Those notable songwriters will always talk about John Prine, you know, because he was the first to do so many of these things that people use today. And that all started with this landmark debut album. I think 50 years later, John's self-titled album was ahead of its time and it was also timeless and I think it just kind of shows that like I said he had a special gift he didn't have to learn how to become a songwriter he just simply was and he's just so missed visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about John Prine you'll also find a link to stream or purchase John Prine self-titled thanks for listening